My name is Stan Dragland. I'm the author of Deep Two. I got some emails from a, a concern called Megadick. You know, trying to sell me a, a penis enlargement. And the language in it was so bizarre that I started, I, I printed these things off and I collected them and gradually started to think, you know, I could make something cohere around this idea of male washrooms, maleness, penis size, the actual dick and the symbol, the symbolic dick, you know, the so-called phallus. Um, at first I thought it would just be funny, you know, amusing stuff, because, you know, you have to be able to, I, I think, as a male, as a female too for that matter, but you have to be able to laugh at yourself, and particularly at some of the outrages perpetrated in the in the name of the of the dick, you know. And uh, it was just going to be funny for a while, but I, I began to realize there's, there's some serious stuff goes on in the name of the of the phallus. So this book takes uh, takes a turn into the dark stuff towards the end. Anyway, that's that's kind of where it where it came. That's where it, kind of where it came from. Uh, no, I don't think my book has any connection with with that stuff at all. Uh, if anything, it's kind of anti-porn, you know. I mean, I've got some pretty obscene stuff in the book. Uh, I've got the Nantucket Limerick, for example, which is, you know, I don't know how much lower they go than that. But I wanted some commentary, <clears throat> to write some commentary on that, on that kind of thing. So there's an edge of porn in the book, but uh, but then I'm trying to interrogate that a little bit and and only a little bit because I'm in a, I I think of this book as uh, it, it it jumps from thing to thing as you know from subject to subject and I'm really hoping that readers will have something to fill in in the, in the blanks you know and if they want to. Hmm, Regarded as a template for reading poor, and that's fine with me. Uh, feminism has done a lot for the relations between the sexes, but the work is not finished by any means. And there's trouble of all kinds in the world. It's not all caused by macho-ness, but uh, some of the edges of, of what I'm writing in this book uh, touch on war and atrocity, and to the extent that some of that is caused by maleness out of control, um, that's an important subject to be thinking about. I can't help think about it. I mean, as I, as I say, some of this business is just funny. And in fact, I think if we could laugh at ourselves a bit more, we might do fewer bad things. But uh, it's a very interesting subject, you know, this macho business. I sometimes think about hockey, for example. Um, I read somewhere that Phil Kessel is the most easily intimidated hockey player in the NHL. And here is a player who, of great skill and beauty. It's a beautiful thing to watch him. But that's one of the ways of assessing this guy. I mean, hockey is a macho business. There's a book by uh, Randy Maggs uh, about Terry Sawchuk, a wonderful book. And he says hockey is a kind of cross between murder and ballet. Um, and I know very well if you're going to survive as a hockey player, you have to be able to take it. You have, to, you have to have courage, you have to beat people up, be willing to, you know, just... I've heard somebody say that uh, even the best players are goons. I hope that's not true. But there's, you know, there's a... I don't, maybe if you kind of are willing to channel all that macho energy into sports and put it into a little theater or rink, you know, maybe that's... That's a good thing. 
as I said before, I've got no answers about these things, but it seems to me that thinking about thinking about this issue is important. Well, I mean, so much of what has to do, you know, I, I don't think women write limericks like the, the one about Nantucket, or in fact, maybe any of these questionable ly uh, limericks. Uh, so uh, I think it's, I think it's natural to, to kind of think about where that stuff comes from, where that, that really, I mean, and also they're funny, you know, limericks are meant to be funny. But there's an edge of really bad taste in, in some of these things. And that edge kind of spills out. You see it in male washroom cubicles, where some of the, the stuff that's up there is misogynist. It's horrible, you know? So I wanted to use, uh, so to, <laughs> to go into some really bad taste as a way of, as a kind of a springboard into, in, into talking about that, that sort of thing, thinking about it a little bit. Um, and I hope that the book is in good taste in general, you know. But when you're using some of these four-letter words that, uh, that are, are offensive, especially to women, when you inscribe them into your book, you, you have to expect. I mean, I'm a little concerned about... Some people just look at the words and they say, I'm not reading that book. Um, but it's a partly it's partly a matter of trying to get some extremes of range in this in this subject, so really bad taste, and then talk about it. Well, I have a banjo in my house in in St. John's. Um, Phil Hall gave it to me one time. It's a tenor banjo. He now plays five string. So he had an extra banjo. He gave it to me and. Uh, one time a friend came over and looked at my banjo and said, that's, that's a very small banjo. And I said, it is not. You know, you have to be able to joke about these size issues. Uh, so the short answer to your question is no, my book doesn't have, you know, anxiety about uh, the size of the book. In fact, it never did occur to me that the size of the book, which was really your decision, had anything to do, with, to do with the content until I saw it. Uh, and now I think it's kind of brilliant, actually. It's a very modest, it's just like my modest-sized book, just just like, like me, you know. Uh, one of the themes of the book is, you know, not to sweat the size business. You know, it's no biggie. And in fact, maybe to try to think about the size business uh, in macro terms as well, and don't don't sweat trying to be a you know be a big macho guy. There's other ways of being a man than that. Well, there are folks who like to read other people's books and then trash them. There's a lot of a lot of people doing that out there, and I have the feeling that is a dick-related business. Um, I won't name any names, but all kinds of people who are listening to this will know who I mean. And that seems to me to be a bad human activity. Um, all of my way of approaching literature is through appreciation and love. I mean, I've considered a gift to be able to read good books and to write about them, you know. And I'm not interested in writing about books that I don't like. Uh, and I don't know why people feel that they, they have to, you know, go to, go to town on, on books and just smash them. I've been writing something al along that, uh, along those lines, <clears throat> trying to write something. I read a book by Dave Bedini, which is, you know, about hockey and, uh, and music. <laughs> and he says musicians, you know, get up on the, it's just, just like hockey players. They, they get up on the stage and they don't want to just do a good job. They want to, you know, smash the other bands they're on with. And, you know, 
uh, I don't think that's necessary. You know, you do a good job and you play and you could admire other people too, you know. It has to do with sharing, it seems to me, and there's a politics attached to that too, which is, if you like, socialism. It's something socialist. So, I think the dick business does does figure into reviewing and criticism. And uh, there's no way to stop that, you know. I have, I've sometimes thought uh, the way to do it is to change human nature. You know, uh, the simple way to do it. Lyle Lovett and his large band at Massey Hall, Toronto, 1980-something. Found my seat, then headed for the washroom to relieve myself for my greater comfort during the concert. And there was the men's, occupied by women, made militant and gone guerrilla by the standard unfairness, way more facilities for men than for women. There was a long line of women outside the women's and another long line of women inside the men's. What to do? I needed a leak, but I was not about to walk up to the urinal, unzip, and proceed. Not in front of all those female strangers. Hauling out the equipment is not supposed to be a performance. Especially private, in my opinion, is that waist dip and butt bob as you haul it back in. So I had two choices. I could suck it up, as they say, suck it up and return to my seat in mild but growing discomfort, or I could endorse the caper of these high-spirited grinning ladies, join the queue, wait for my turn, wait my turn for the single stall. The decision had to be made instantly, you understand. Telling about it takes a lot longer. I really wanted a leak. I joined the ladies. I had shuffled ahead just a couple of places when a man's voice behind us blurted, Jesus Christ! We all looked around. Nobody. Gone. Seems like some men haven't got the stones to join a lineup of ladies in the men's. So finally it's my turn. I close the stall door, unzip, take my stance. Outside I hear a musing, quiet but perfectly clear. Strange to see the feet pointed in that direction. Then another voice cautioning. Yes but we'd better be quiet or he won't be able. True, there is more than one kind of performance anxiety. Grateful not to be discussed any further, I whiz, flush, exit the stall and head for the door, smiling a complicit smile as I pass the queue.